Feet by Azine Arefi. You do everything for them, don't you? You file their nails and paint them colors called fugitive and instinct that you take forever to pick out. You buy them shiny rings and show them off during the summer in sandals. Shoes, shoes, shoes. You constantly spoil them with those. The latest acquisition is a pink alligator patterned baby doll pair. And what do they do? Your feet still betray you. They take you places you should not go. Not just standard places you shouldn't go, like down the cookie cracker cereal aisle, where all of your weaknesses are lined up like smiling children, but real places you shouldn't go, like his house. But you find yourself in front of his door, and you look down at your feet, smiling with their shiny coral toes, called orgasm, and ask, why? Why have you brought me here? Your feet know just as well as you do that he will say something inappropriate and hurtful, or worse, he might do something perfect and fool you into another cycle. But your feet march you right up his front steps and are just as willing to take you inside, inside his room, even into his arms if he would take you. These feet that you are so good to, the ones you pamper with peppermint lotion and warm salt baths, the ones you spoil every other week at the Vietnamese nail salon you visit, they are too damn lazy to ever run, which is exactly what they would do now if they were good, grateful feet, but they're not. You met him like everyone else meets their man, at the post office. <laughs> you were standing in line trying to amuse yourself by listening to the clerk try her hardest to explain something to the little Chinese man, but it was a lost cause. He just kept pointing his bony finger at the scrap of paper with the address scribbled on it. Then he walked in. He was one of those guys you can't help but notice, tall, lean like a racehorse and almost as graceful, a little shaggy, and right then you knew you should have put some lipstick on. But who does that to go across the street? Even now, if you looked out of the window, you could see your apartment. Who would have thought that you had to brush your hair because he was going to walk in? When he stood right behind you, he didn't even look at you. But you, despite lack of lipstick, did not move away from him. Maybe you even edged your way a little closer. And then boom, it happened. He stepped on your foot. Your always useful feet. And that was enough. Weeks later, when so much more than your feet had touched, you asked him coyly if he stepped on your foot on purpose that first day. He focused on the ceiling for a second and then said, I stepped on you? I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> they look like your mother's feet. Everyone can see that, the same sturdy square nails with the exception of the pinky nail, which is triangular. The second toe long but crouching. The four digits leaning against the thumb like something next to them reeked. But they don't act like your mother's feet. Your mother's feet went from her parents' house to her husband's house. Your feet now walk on a floor that belongs neither to your father nor to a husband. The floor belongs to you. Actually, the floor belongs to your Indian landlord, but you're not hung up on technicalities. You are quite proud of your little apartment high up in the complex overlooking a bookstore, vintage clothing stores, and the post office. You've added your personal touch to it by putting up your photographs. You've included plants just to make sure you are not the only thing alive in the place. You only have such sentiments when there is an absence of men in your life. When they're around, you sometimes forget to water the plants. Your favorite thing to do in the apartment was to sink into the couch with them, put your feet up on the coffee table, and watch movies. Sometimes, while watching a particularly slow scene, your eyes would wander to your feet together, socked or bare, depending on whether the radiator was working overtime or not at all. You were convinced that the radiator was possessed. That's your way of explaining the inexplicable. During those times, your feet looked almost as content as the two of you. Your mother's feet seemed to have never been anywhere they should not have been. They never walked home alone late at night. Your mother's feet never had to walk her to her apartment, one that was cheap and situated in downtown. Her feet were smarter than that. And every damn night you're pacing home, trying to keep that delicate balance between a nice steady gait that exudes confidence and yet is fast enough to get you home as soon as possible, 
you think to yourself, of course you're safe. Nothing's going to happen. Don't even think about it because thinking it might send something into the cosmos and force it to happen. But there is still that voice in the back of your head, muffled underneath the sound of your feet striking the pavement, that something could happen. And nothing is as relieving as the smell of Indian food rushing down the hall at you as soon as you open the front door to your apartment complex. Every other time you hate that smell and the way it clings to your hair, but late at night walking home, it is the only thing you long for. Of course, you don't worry about any of that when someone is there to walk you home. His thumbs collect and spread on the soles of your feet. His fingers work their way to your toes. You involuntarily knock your head back, close your eyes, and wait for the wave of pleasure. You feel his lips and warm tongue on your toes, and you know that what he's doing to your feet is only a prelude to what he's going to do to the rest of you. The anticipation, the promise, sends a murmuring current through your body. His lips begin to move from your feet and slowly trace your leg, and suddenly you don't know what to do with your hands or with this buildup. You are addicted to him just as much as your feet are. Even in that instant of concentrated lust, darkness, sheets, and warmth, when you are in your body more than in your mind, the thought swims into your head. What will your feet do when he's no longer around? Going to the post office has now become a chore. That's the problem with meeting someone at a place of service. You wouldn't go except that yet again you have procrastinated and now the application for your photography submission needs to be sent overnight. Certified. You find it funny that $13.25 is going to buy you a guarantee. You stand in line and fidget from one foot to the other and try very hard not to think of the person you met here almost eight, no, nine months ago. You're pretty successful, too. You're not thinking about his smile, nor his smell, nor his hands. None of it. You are looking at the collectible stamps and the matching stationery promoting spaying and neutering your pets. <laughs> then you notice the woman standing in front of you has a beard. A full-on beard. Not a couple of strays here and there, but one your dad could grow. <laughs> you try not to stare or be obvious in any way. But it's like a bad accident. Twisted metal and the possibility of blood. Her chin hairs are long and gray, like the stringy hair that shoots out of her head. They seem like spikes, ready to be unfurled onto the next victim who dares to gape at them. It is her turn now, and she moves up to the window. You stare at her back and wonder at what point did she stop plucking her chin hairs? At what point did she decide that it was futile to painfully pull them out when all they did was grow back more stubborn than ever? What made her decide to give up, all be damned? Thinking about her beard makes your own chin itch. You start to think maybe she has the right idea, after all. You obsessively yank out any hair that is out of place, and where has it gotten you? Are you more fulfilled than her? It must be so liberating, you think. The beard lady is not bound to her excess facial hair. And as she walks off and you move up to take her place, you can't help but think that somehow, in some feminist way you don't have words for, she is better off than you. Lying in bed in the familiar darkness of your bedroom, you see the word alone taking shape above your head. And it makes you more sad than it scares you. The letters seem to spread out, the O expanding in the middle. It gets so big that you can see yourself falling right into it. What would it be like to just grab hold of the O like a giant lifesaver, swing your feet around, step inside, and let yourself fall into it? Where would alone take you? You have seen your mother's feet dance, but you know yours have already danced more. Yours have been stepped on a couple more times, too. But maybe her dance partners were just more coordinated. Your mother has better taste. Or better luck. The radiator is possessed again. It is extremely hot in your apartment, and the steam has turned it into a sauna. Perhaps if you were business savvy, you would charge your neighbors by the hour to come sit and unwind in your kitchen. But business savvy is one of the many things you are not. And secretly, you're glad of it. Normally, you do not complain about the heat and the humidity. You prefer it to when whatever it is that gets hold of the radiator's soul lets go and it sleeps for days. You prefer the sauna to the meat locker. But this time, the radiator's clanging is out of control. Bang, bang, bang! It has not stopped for two hours and 23 minutes. 
You've stopped trying to ignore it, turning up the TV, blasting your music. Now you are just waiting for these seven minutes to pass so that when you call your landlord at this hour, you can give him a nice round number. The radiator has been clanging for two and a half hours, you will say. It's all about having the power of words on your side. Some people can't sleep at night. Ooh, yep. Ooh, yes, okay. Some people can't sleep at night thinking about their bills or their dry cleaning or the emails they've not answered. Some people can't sleep because they see ghosts. You can't sleep because of a faceless, amorphous woman. She comes to you as soon as you get into bed and turn the lights out. Some nights she looks dark and gorgeous. Other nights she is blonde and leggy. Most nights she has a great body. Sometimes she's similar to you, the way she talks, the way she laughs. Other times she's nothing like you. She's better. The only thing she consistently does not have is better looking feet. But perhaps he's not looking down. When you open the door to your landlord, he walks right in and proceeds to the radiator. He brings the smell of his house with him, and although you have seen it a hundred times, the sight of his protruding belly catches you by surprise. He asks in his endearing accent, So, what seems to be the problem here? <laughs> you bypass the obvious cloud formations in your apartment and go straight for the noise. Well, the clanging, you say. The bang, bang, bang. And he looks you straight in the eyes and asks, what bing, bing, bing? <laughs> For about five seconds, your mind is blank, and then there is a deluge of thought. What? He doesn't hear the clanging? Is it just you? Have you been imagining it for the past three hours? You stare into this man's eyes, his brown irises in a pool of yellow, and think, this is it. This is what it must feel like to go crazy. You are standing at the edge of sanity and insanity. This must be the line. Who would have thought that the line would be the clanging of a radiator? Is there any way to stop it, to stop the insanity from creeping in any further? You look down at your feet. And right then, in the middle of that thought, your landlord laughs and says, I'm just kidding with you. <laughs> <laughs> and bends down to the nozzle. You didn't know you were holding your breath, but now you sputter out air. You look down at the back of your landlord's head at his emerging bald spot, and you cannot decide if you want to hit him with a chair or hug him. <laughs> she crawls into your mind, gnawing at your brain each night. She dares you to go ahead and ask her your questions. She knows you're not strong enough to hear the answers. Do you really want to know if he kisses her the same way he kissed you? Does he insist on seeing her the way he did you? Does he make love to her the same way? For make love, you substitute fuck, and you can't decide which scenario is worse. Does he say the same things to her in and out of bed? You want her to disappear to let you be. But what you really want is for her to disappear for him. And as long as he is on your mind, as long as you take him to bed with you every night, she will climb right up in there with the two of you. When he is done, your landlord walks up to your futon, where you are pretending to read, and says, well, I closed it off for now, the nozzle from downstairs, so that it does not make the noise. I will have to look at it again later to fix the problem, but for now, it's good. <laughs> you thank him. He's rolling his sleeves back down. He'd rolled them up and untucked his shirt as well due to the heat. Halfway to the door, he stops and says to you, I'm sorry I upset you with my joke earlier about not hearing the noise. Oh, that's okay, you say, not wanting to relive it. I only joked with you because you seem sad. Contradictory feelings again. You want to kill him and embrace him at once. Is everything okay with you? He asks. And looking at him, you know he is sincere. Yes, you mutter, I'm fine. Your throat tightens. He stares at you some more. You take it as him not believing you. A part of you wants to scream and say, no, everything is not okay, and I don't know why, but I am not okay, and perhaps I will be later on, but right now everything that makes up my life is lacking something, and it is not okay, not okay at all. But you do no such thing. You want him to leave. And when he finally does, you stumble into your bedroom, grab one of the pillows off your bed, run into the closet, put the pillow to your face, and you cry, and you cry, and you cry. The last time you talked to your mother, you wished that she had noticed something. You wished she had sensed something in your voice, and your curt answer, something, to let her know that her only daughter was not happy. But she seemed to think you were fine. 
Perhaps you are. Perhaps if something was truly wrong, your mother, equipped with motherly instinct and you being torn from her flesh, would have sensed it. You must trust in that. If not, it might mean that you are beyond recognition, so far removed from the daughter she raised that she can no longer tell the difference between you and your sad version. You think to yourself, no, you'd never kill yourself over a man. Never. But what about over all the men? All the ones that came and went, all the ones that didn't love you, and even the ones that did but loved you selectively, loved certain parts and not others, as if you could pull yourself through a sieve somehow. <laughs> they, every single one of them, loved your feet. Or the ones that confused you, because you could never tell if they did love you or not, and by the end of it you couldn't tell if they were just indecisive or if you really were not worth loving. What if you put them all together? Is it okay to kill yourself then? You'd still have to say no. But what if you put all of those men together, including this latest one, and counted all the brain cells you wasted on finding the difference between I'll see you later and I'll talk to you later, or deciphering his voicemails? Brain cells consumed trying to figure out what you did wrong or what is wrong with you as a person, knowing all the while that you will never have the answers. All those brain cells that could have possibly helped you remember the capital of Bolivia or the circumference of the earth, wasted. Add to that the buckets of tears you cried and cried over them, which would have been better spent on Save the Polar Bear commercials. All the extra minutes and texts on your cell phone with bills to match. All those sleepless nights haunted by her. Or instead you could have been sleeping and dreaming of falling or meadows or your childhood home like normal people. All and all put together to make you unrecognizable, even to yourself, to get you here, to this moment, standing at the window, looking down and asking your feet, could you do it? Could you jump? You put your palms against the cold glass and watch people down below, mostly going in and out of the post office, their faces not distinguishable from up here. Then all of a sudden you realize there is no reason not to jump. Nothing holding you back from stepping out onto the windowsill, closing your eyes. Should one's eyes be closed or should one keep them open till the end? And jumping. Nothing but the cold glass. That and your feet. You can't tell if you can rely on them to leave the windowsill and for once, just once, walk on air. You're not sure if you can rely on them to do what you want them to do. Slowly you notice that the glass is disappearing under your palms. Now it's gone. You can hear the street noise better. You can smell the wind. And someone in the building is definitely cooking with onions. Now it is just you, palms in the air, and your feet. Your betraying, fickle, beautiful, passionate, pampered feet. And what will your feet do? What will they do?